In January 1917, Lenin, who at the time was living in exile in Switzerland, delivered a speech to a small group of Swiss young socialists. In the course of this speech, he made the following remark. I'm already an old man, and I may never live to see the revolution. It will be up to you, the young people, to carry on the struggle. And yet, only a matter of weeks after those words had been pronounced, Lenin, to his astonishment, heard the newsboys running selling papers in the streets of Zurich, shouting out, Revolution in Russia! Revolution in Russia! Now, the fact that Lenin himself did not expect the February Revolution, I think that speaks volumes. Because this really was a most unexpected uh, development. And in fact, on the face of it, one could uh, imagine that at that time, uh, such, uh, such an extraordinary development would seem to be ruled out by a whole series of circumstances, which perhaps most of you have not perhaps carefully considered. First of all, of course, Tsarist Russia itself was, as we know, an extremely backward country. It was actually more backward, considerably more backward, I would say, than Pakistan at the present time. Here you had this vast subcontinent of a country, a vast country of 150 million inhabitants, and yet, out of that population of 150 million, there were only less than 4 million industrial workers, and even if one includes the broadest category, including transport, mines and so on, not more than 10 million. Not more than 10 million workers in a population of 150 million people. So an extraordinarily backward country with a relatively weak working class as far as numbers are concerned. Moreover, Tsarist Russia at the time, we shouldn't forget this, was a monstrous dictatorship, a monstrous autocratic regime, a police state. The Tsar of Russia had at his disposal, theoretically, a huge army, perhaps the biggest army in the world, about 10 million soldiers, if my memory serves me correctly. A huge army, a huge police force, a vast network of police, police spies, the Okhrana, the secret police, which uh, extended its tentacles throughout the whole of Russian society, and even infiltrated the political parties, including, by the way, the Bolshevik party, up to quite a high level. And therefore, on the face of it, the idea that such a regime could be overthrown by a revolution seemed to be, to put it mildly, improbable. Yes, but there's more. You see, the February Revolution, we must not forget, took place during a war. That's the reason Lenin was in exile. It was a, a period of warfare. Europe was plunged into what uh, Lunacharsky described, the Russian Bolshevik described in one of his, one of his uh, works, as Europe in the dance of death. Here you had the spectacle of millions of workers in, in uniform, British, French, Russian, Austrian, Hungarian, fighting and killing each other in the cause of imperialism. The Second International, the uh, Socialist International, to which, by the way, all the Socialists joined, uh, were, were members prior to 1914. Lenin, Trotsky, Rosa Luxemburg, James Connolly, were all members of the Second International. An international which, year after year, Congress after Congress had voted unanimously that in the event of war breaking out, the, the international, the working class, would not fight each other, but would actually take advantage of the situation to carry through a revolution. Well, far from it. Far from it. In the moment of truth, the darkest day, if you like, in the history of international socialism, in the summer of 1914, every single leadership of every single socialist party in the world, with two exceptions, the Russians and the Serbs, disgracefully voted for the war credits and supported their own
bourgeoisie, their own imperialist government. So here you have it. An apparently hopeless situation. Lenin, as I say, was in exile. At that time, incidentally, he, he, he was hardly in contact with anybody in Russia. Could not be in contact with it. Or rather, it was extremely difficult to establish contact. The movement in Russia was underground. Political parties were illegal. The Bolshevik party was underground, of course. And therefore, if one considers all of these uh, terrible uh, objective difficulties, one could perhaps have been forgiven for drawing the conclusion, well, revolution is impossible. As indeed today, many people think that, wrongly think, that revolution is impossible. But you know, revolution has got, got a habit of appearing on the scene when least expected. It was Trotsky that uh, really expressed this phenomenon uh, best of all in a marvelously profound phrase which he used where he referred to the molecular process of socialist revolution. Or to go back to Karl Marx's uh, o old uh, analogy with the mole, the, the, the mole of the revolution burrows deep beneath the surface, carries out its work invisibly until finally it emerges in the light of day. This process, the uh, accumulation, the slow accumulation of anger, of rage, of discontent, of bitterness, which continues uninterruptedly, although it's not uh, immediately visible on the surface, but it's there in the factories, in the trenches, the discontent of the workers and the soldiers and the, the workers' wives, the women played a big role in the February Revolution, as we shall see was gradually accumulating until it reaches that critical point, to use the expression from physics, a critical point, a tipping point, where, to use the dialectical expression, quantity becomes transformed into quality. Russian society at that time, of course, was in a desperate uh, position. The masses, of course, were living in desperate uh, conditions of shortages, of lack of bread, while, of course, on the other hand, in the, in the upper reaches of society, you have a, 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 a disgusting spectacle of degeneracy, of orgies, of uh, the Rasputin clique, the uh, rotten clique around the, the Tsarist regime, which began to smell bad, if you like, in, in the nostrils of society. Uh, there's an interesting book which I would recommend, uh, The Memoirs. It's called, actually, The Memoirs of a British Agent by a man called Bruce Lockhart, who was in fact uh, a British agent working in the British Embassy throughout this period. A very sharp observer, Lockhart, not by any means a Marxist of course, but a sharp observer nonetheless, who gives an account of these parties and uh, glittering gatherings of the uh, aristocracy, parties attended by the aristocrats, by the, uh, the charming ladies of the court and so on, and as he adds, by officers who should be at the front but are instead are enjoying themselves, in parties where, as, as Lockhart puts it, the champagne flowed like water, and the same man, the same Lockhart says, looking out of the windows, in the streets below, in the freezing cold, you had queues of ragged looking people, women in the main, waiting patiently for bread which never comes. And this was the position, the contradictions were building up to such an extent that eventually they reached a critical point and interestingly enough since we are now at the anniversary of the uh, 8th of March 1917, exactly 100 years ago, the 8th of March International Women's Day and that's not an accident, things finally came to a head. Now it's interesting to note, by the way, that uh, women, that's to say working class women, I'm not talking here about uh, intellectuals or smart ladies from the universities and, and so on and so forth. No, working class women from the factories, and of course many workers in many countries, including Russia, many uh, workers were women because the men were fighting at the front. There was a shortage of, uh, of labor. And therefore, these, these women, these, these women workers, suffering dreadful exploitation and uh, oppression in, in the workshops, and at the same time, having to feed hungry children under these conditions, uh, reached the limit of their patience. And it was the women, actually, 
that led the February Revolution. It's an actual fact, not an accident, by the way, that women, if you like, that were excluded from politics, excluded from history, if you like, suddenly emerge as a leading militant revolutionary force. Same thing happened, incidentally, in the Great French Revolution, where it was the women that actually uh, disgraced the men, if you like, they, they forced the men to follow them uh, in the attack on, on, uh, on, uh, on Versailles, on the, on the royal, uh, on, the, on the king. Well, it was a similar thing here in Russia. And here's an interesting point. These uh, supposedly backward women workers, uh, politically illiterate, if you like, never read any serious political books, weren't members of any political party, but they'd had enough. Simply, simply, they'd had enough. And that's all that is required to explain the situation. But when they went to the advanced, the advanced workers, the, the Bolsheviks and so on, there was a small group of Bolsheviks. The Bolshevik party was very small at this time. Hardly had any influence on the mass of the working class. Proposing that they, the women, were going to come out to demonstrate on the 8th of March against the atrocious conditions, against the war, against the shortage of bread and so on. The advice of the Bolsheviks was, no, don't do that. You mustn't do that because you'd be shot down in cold blood, as happened, of course, in 1905, one must remember, on the 9th of January. But you see, once the masses get the idea that they've had enough, well, they've had enough. And no amount of clever, smart advice from advanced people would make the slightest bit of difference. No, these heroic women went onto the streets anyway in a massive demonstration. And truly, truly, it was a massive demonstration, which then, of course, was joined, very qu quickly joined by workers, some of whom were, were already on strike. The workers in the Patilov factory, the arms factory, in particular, were, were on strike, and the strike became general. The women went to the factories, calling their men out on strike, which they succeeded in, in doing. Yes, but you see, the problem is here. Just think about it. This, these strikes were illegal. This demonstration was certainly illegal. Now here you have, of course, a state apparatus, a formidable apparatus of, of repression, with, with what is theoretically colossal forces at their disposal. Yes, yes, but of course, in the moment of truth, this colossal power turned out to be a gigantic zero. We have, as Trotsky quotes this in his marvellous book, the history of the Russian Revolution, how the chief of police in Petrograd frantically rings around trying to get the troops to turn out, to repress the demonstrators, to put a stop to this uh, business, and of course the soldiers refuse to come out. Most of them refuse to come out. Those that did come out refused to uh, shoot or fire against uh, the demonstrators. And that even applied to the Cossacks, who were, after all, the, the shock troops of reaction, the same brutal force which had repressed every single revolution, every single strike, every single demonstration, for as long as anyone could remember. And yet even the Cossacks, this perhaps was a decisive turning point. The soldiers on the 25th of, of February, if my memory serves me correctly, that's in the old calendar, of course, 13 days later than the present calendar, so 8th of March, of course, is uh, late February. On the 25th of February, the Tsar issued a, per a personal order that these disorders on the streets of Petrograd must be put down by force. And yet, you see, in the moment of truth, this force did not exist. The whole apparently powerful edifice of the state collapsed like a house of cards. The Cossacks refused to, to, to react. Uh, Trotsky, in his uh, History of the Russian Revolution, relates the following incident, that the, the de here the demonstrators advance in a huge crowd towards the line of Cossacks, mounted soldiers, quite a frightening sight it must have been, on these great big war horses with their sabres drawn, waiting to, uh, apparently, to, to, to cut down the demonstrators, to kill them in cold blood, to shoot at, shoot at them and so on. And yet, in the moment of truth, these Cossacks did nothing. They did nothing, they just sat on their horses, looking, staring into space, I suppose, in front of them. And the demonstrators advanced, 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 and gradually advanced under the bellies of the horses. 
That's right. The Demetrius went under the bellies of the horses of the Cossacks, and the Cossacks also did nothing. And Trotsky relates the incident where one of the Cossack soldiers actually looks at one of the demonstrators and winks. Just like that. A very significant thing. Very significant little incident, that. That expressed the whole reality of the situation. That in the moment of truth, the base of the old regime just collapsed. It simply collapsed. And therefore, if you like, in the first days of the revolution, Power was lying in the streets, waiting for somebody to pick it up. The question, of course, arises, who is going to do this? Who is going to pick up the power? Now, of course, the bourgeois, the bourgeois so-called liberals, organized around the Duma, which was a kind of semi-parliament, anyway, had no real powers, but it was supposed to be a parliament and a government, it immediately set up what was known as the Provisional Committee. It appeared by magic as if from nowhere, led by people like, like Rodzianko and uh, Milyukov in particular, the leader of the, the cadets, the Constitutional Democrat Party, which was the Liberal Party, in order to try to take control of the situation. The Liberal bourgeois, if you like, were not in favour of revolution, that goes without saying, but they were prepared to lean on the revolution to extract concessions from the Tsar. And what they basically wanted, there was frantic uh, telephone calls and so on to arrange this, was to preserve all that they could of the old system and to preserve the monarchy. They offered the monarchy to, uh, uh, to Michael, who was uh, the Tsar's brother, the Tsar's relative anyway. Which of course uh, uh, failed. It failed because the, the workers, the masses, were not going to have any of that. They'd had enough of the Romanovs, and this, uh, the monarchy, of course, had to go. But the Liberals wanted to preserve the law. They wanted a constitutional monarchy, like in Britain. Yes, but the problem that they had was that the Russian workers, basing themselves on the tradition of the earlier revolution of 1905, immediately moved to set up their own revolutionary power, which was the Soviets. As you may know, the Russian word Soviet, Soviet in Russian, just means a council or a committee. The Soviets, in their origin, the original form in 1905, were neither more nor less than extended strike committees, that's all. Marvellous democratic organizations elected by delegates from the factories and so on. The difference, however, between the Soviets in 1917 and the, the Soviets of 1905 is this. The basic weakness of the Soviets in 1905 was that they did not have, they did not extend to the peasantry. And the big majority of the Russian people, of course, were, in fact, peasants. But you see, the war changed all that. The war mobilized the peasantry, put the peasants in uniform. The great majority of the army were, of course, precisely that, peasants in uniform. And therefore, you also had the formation of peasants, or soldier Soviets, which, of course, immediately fused, very quickly fused, with the workers' Soviets to form Soviets of workers and soldiers, in other words, Soviets of workers and peasants. And in point of fact, already in February, the truth of the matter is, the real power was in the hands of the Soviets, particularly the Petrograd Soviet, which exercised a colossal uh, power and a colossal uh, influence. Now you can say what you like about revolution, and a lot of nonsense, of course, will be talked about uh, revolution in the coming months, you can bet your bottom dollar on that. But this was a colossal emancipation, a wonderful feeling of emancipation, of liberation, which reminds me of the words of the great uh, English poet, uh, William Wordsworth, when he was in France at, during the French Revolution uh, of the 18th century, he said the following, Bliss t'was in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. That's Wordsworth. And that's true of any great revolution, by the way. Certainly true of the Russian Revolution, beginning in February. But in February, it was still, shall we say, in its early stages. You always get the same uh, stage. Revolution proceeds through stages. It's like a great big street carnival. Everybody's happy, everybody's united, everybody's full of joy. Uh, one eyewitness points out that he goes along to a demonstration and a young, uh, very pretty young girl turns up to him and embraces him and kisses him and so on. Uh, 
because of this enormous feeling of emancipation. It was a great emancipation of the Russian people after centuries of the most oppressive, the most monstrous oppression under this rotten Tsarist regime. The people felt free. They felt that they had won. However, and we must make this very clear, in point of fact they had not yet won. In point of fact, the great battle still lay ahead. This was clearly understood by Lenin, although initially, as we will see, the leaders of the Bolshevik party in Petrograd didn't understand this. Kamenev and Stalin in particular did not understand this. They went under the, the pressure of bourgeois and petty bourgeois public opinion. The idea of unity, all progressive forces together, the usual nonsense, which was put forward by the Mensheviks in the past and subsequently is was put forward, of course, by the Stalinists also. This was the, the, the line. Lenin, of course, in Switzerland had a different attitude altogether. Lenin bombarded the Bolsheviks in Petrograd with urgent demands. No trust in the Provisional Government, the Provisional Committee eventually ended up by calling itself the Provisional Government, led by all kinds of bourgeois elements, who did not have any real base in society. They put forward as the Prime Minister, some, Prince Lvov, for example, another member of the royal family. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Lockhart actually makes the comment he met. He, apparently he was a friend of uh, Prince Lvov. And he says the following, that he was a very charming man who would have made an excellent uh, chairman of the London County Council. That was his, his uh, impression of, of Lvov. These boys were represented nothing and nobody but themselves. The real power was in the hands of the Soviet. Even the, even the provisional government knew that. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't get a tram running without the permission of the Soviet. And of course, really speaking, the Soviet should have taken power. Power was in the hands of the Soviet, but of course the, there was a problem. The problem was a problem of leadership. And that, of course, brings us to the next episode in the revolution, which we will discuss subsequently. Suffice to say, in relation to the February Revolution, the masses were strong enough to overthrow the old regime, to overthrow the Romanovs, but they had not yet acquired sufficient organization and consciousness to take the next logical and necessary step. That is to say, to take power into their own hands through the mechanism of the Soviet. In order to do that, however, it was necessary that the Bolsheviks should emerge as the leadership instead of the reformist leaders who confined the revolution or attempted to, to confine the revolution to the limits of bourgeois democracy and support for the provisional government, which of course could solve none of the basic problems of the Russian workers and peasants. For that, a second revolution was necessary.